Okay. So, as usual, we have to give some disclaimers. So, as you know, the primary immunodeficiency diseases, although we started with a very few of them, uh, but as of today, we have more than 300 different primary immunodeficiency diseases. There are more than 400 gene mutations we have been assigned to these disorders. And one of the very important things to realize is that as the name suggests primary immunodeficiency diseases, so we always think about them as the diseases of children. But I can tell you that primary immunodeficiency is, if not more, at least as common as in children. And the difference being that in children, majority of these primary immunodeficiency diseases are monogenic. That means they have a single gene defect which is causing them and often they are much more serious, and at time they are the immunological emergencies that they have to be treated in a short period of time, otherwise they will scramble to death. Especially in adults, there are certain immune deficiency which may take as much as 20 years from the time of the symptom to the diagnosis, and that emphasizes that we need more and more awareness and education in the field of primary immunodeficiencies. Currently, primary immunodeficiencies have been grouped in nine different groups, and we are not going to talk of all of them. Uh, in addition to increased susceptibility to autoimmune diseases and autoimmunity and malignancies, more commonly patients with primary immunodeficiencies have increased susceptibility to vaccine-preventable infections. These are the common infections. So what I'm going to do is, this is a whole laundry list of my presentation, that I'll talk to you about the vaccine and vaccination, the primary immunodeficiencies, grouping them into the severe type, and the moderately, which have the very high susceptibility to infections, and those who are uh, that group which doesn't have very much increased susceptibility to that extent because the immunization schedule will be very different. Then the vaccines, to give you a flavor of what are the viable or live vaccine versus killed vaccine. Then getting into vaccination, so taking each of the vaccine and giving that vaccination in primary immunodeficiency and then vaccination in patients who are receiving intravenous immunoglobulin or immunoglobulin therapy, not intravenous, whether it is subcutaneous or intravenous immunoglobulin, and the patients who are on immunosuppressive regimen because uh, some of our patients, they are also in addition to intravenous immunoglobulin or subcutaneous immunoglobulin, they are also receiving certain immunosuppressive agents as well as some of the biologics. I'll touch a little bit on very briefly to allergy to vaccine and that has nothing to do with the PID which vaccine in general. Uh, and th there's some interesting thing in that. Then always some of the questions which are asked, can I give so many vaccines together? Can I give at the same site? So the administration of the vaccine and that once I finish that, then I have a quiz for you guys. <laughs> okay, so let's begin with uh, what's the vaccination and immunization? It is the administration of the material which is derived from the microbes in order to induce a protective immune response without inducing the disease per se. So that's a very important thing, and that's where it comes. The benefit is to induce the response, and the risk are not to cause the disease by that vaccination. Modern vaccinations are extremely safe and effective, but by no way or no term as an absolute one. So they are not completely effective, and they are not completely safe, even in normal people. And of course, in immunodeficient individuals, both safety and efficacy are 
compromised. So how the vaccines are recommended. So there's a process here. Uh, all the recommendations of the vaccine is developed by a advisory committee of immunization practices, ACIP, and ACIP take some of the, this is done in collaboration with American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Family Practice, American College of Physicians, American College of Obstetrics Gynecology, and College of Nursing Wives, Midwives. And these recommendations are then voted by the board of ASIP, then reviewed by the CDC director, and once adopted, they are published in Mortality and Morbidity Weekly Report of CDC, and then it becomes really the final official recommendation of Human Health Services and CDC. And you can imagine, there are recommendations on the in immunocompromised host by CDC and HSS. There's no specific recommendation for primary immunodeficiency diseases because those recommendations are either you have severe immunocompromised host as a result of cancer, chemotherapy, or immunosuppressive therapy, the second group with HIV, and third group in which there are other diseases, chronic renal diseases, sickle cell disease, uh, and so on, or somebody born with, without a spleen or somebody who had the spleen removed. So those are the three categories in which the U.S. recommendations are. So what are the recommendations and risk and benefit I'm going to tell you? They are based on scientific evidence of the benefit and the risk. Uh, and wherever all the data are not available, uh, there, of course, they are based on just the expert opinion uh, of uh, ourselves. So the vaccine, it, you can divide into two categories. There are one other vaccine, which are really microorganisms. Either you attenuate them, so you are modifying them, or you can totally inactivate them or kill them. Organism. Those live vaccines which are attenuated they carry the risk because sometimes the bacteria virus can undergo reversal to a virulent form and cause the disease. And this is one thing which we'll take very much into consideration when we talk about the primary immunodeficiency. And this is unlike the kill vaccine or inactivated vaccines uh, where you do not, uh, pose, they do not pose that uh, side effect. And second is you can take the component of the microbe or a specific protein subunits, just like the toxoid uh, you can use. So here are the examples of the attenuated, live and attenuated vaccine. Here you have the whole list, uh, and I will discuss later on some of these. Uh, if you look at the varicella zoster vaccine, uh, varicella has been also combined in MMR, to give at one time. However, that's not very much used because adding that vaccine to MMR somehow has been uh, seen to induce more febrile illness and in some cases epilepsy. So it's not very much used. Uh, but then you have a varicella and then you have a zoster uh, vaccines. So we'll come back to those. Here are the inactivated or kill vaccine you see here. A number of these vaccines are conjugated. That means they are piggyback on other protein. Or, for example, you will see the Pneumovax, I will see later on. It is piggyback on the diphtheria protein. And in some of these cases, you have adjuvant. Adjuvants are the molecules that will enhance the immune response to the vaccine. All vaccines that have adjuvant, they have to be given intramuscularly, not subcutaneously, because subcutaneously they will produce local irritation and inflammatory responses. Number of recombinant vaccines in that preparation, 
they contain traces of neomycin antibiotic. So if some patient is allergic to neomycin, they should be very, very careful in getting it. It looks like, you know, you got the recombinant vaccine, you have nothing to worry about. So this is continuing the, uh, the list of uh, other inactivated or non-viable vaccines. So when we divide the primary immunodeficiency based upon susceptibility to infections, you have as those which are very high as increased susceptibility to infection. You have a severe combined immunodeficiencies, the classical one, you have the combined immunodeficiency, like the person that I was trained with, Bob Good, the Good syndrome, it is, it is a severe combined immunodeficiency of adults, usually uh, people 50 years or older, and they are both their T cell and B cell system is totally knocked out, very similar to skin in children. Uh, a complete d syndrome, uh, so these are the thymic aplasia, but a complete d syndrome, again, they have normal immunoglobulin, but they don't make a specific antibody response. So if you immunize them, they will not have a response to that. Then you have a severe antibody deficiency. So one is excellent a gamma globinemia, or butin type a gamma globinemia, and severe cases of common variable immunodeficiency disease. Then you have disease of the innate, because those are the example of adaptive immunity. Now there are the example of the innate immunity, uh, the classical example being the defect of the phagocytic cell, which represented by a chronic granulomatous disease, and then the patients who are receiving biologics, immunosuppressive drug, or corticosteroids. And I will touch upon that as, uh, as well. The mild immunodeficiency diseases are the one which are a specific antibody deficiency, and I think during this course of the conference you must have uh, learned about them, IgG subclass deficiency, and a subset, which are the mild uh, CVID patients. Uh, the other component of the innate immunity is the complement deficiencies. Uh, they are not that severely susceptible to infection, though in certain cases they do. Autoinflammatory diseases, this is a new group of diseases. They are neither immunodeficient nor they are autoimmune, uh, but they have been placed in this new category. So there you don't have very much problem with infections. Disorders of immune regulation, again, uh, you get a lot of autoimmunity, but not that much of the infections. Uh, and then if you have immunosuppression, which is very mild immunosuppression. So there are a few general comments I'll make about inactivated vaccine first. Inactivated vaccines are safe and should be given as per routine to the patient with PID with few exceptions. And the reason being because they won't be effective. So there, there's no risk for giving them, but at the same time, they are not effective. So if something is not effective, why you want to give? So those are severe combined immunodeficiency, severe antibody deficiencies, uh, receiving a prolonged immunosuppressive treatment, and lastly, immunoglobulin replacement, because immunoglobulin has all specific antibody with the exception of the flu, because flu changes the strain every year, so we can't have in those normal donors those antibodies, and therefore everybody should get the flu vaccine. Uh, the inactivated flu vaccine, mm -hmm. and if somebody is traveling to African country, the, you won't have the antibodies to yellow fever or to typhoid. So there are few of those that you do not have antibodies, but with those exceptions, if a patient is on immunoglobulin therapy, you do not require immunization with inactive uh, vaccines as well as active vaccines. HIP, meningococcal, and pneumococcal vaccine, they should be given to all children under per schedule. 
and pneumococcal vaccine, as you know, they have impaired immune response, even with a milder form. And therefore, there you can give equivalent to a booster. So you give first a Prevenar, which is a piggyback on a diphtheria, so it is a conjugated uh, pneumovax, followed about four to eight weeks later, a regular pneumovax, which is a pneumovax 23, which is purely a polysaccharide uh, and uh, vaccine. And the reason being that by giving first Prevenar, you really prime the immune system and second time you come. So those patients and our patients are impaired. They don't make normal immune response. Uh, so in those cases, this is what should be done. Uh, similar uh, recommendations are for uh, the meningococcal. HIV is not recommended for five years and older. However, if it is required, then you, one dose may be given those who have not received prior immunization. Then this is very, very important, the HPV vaccine. It should be given in immunodeficiencies where there's an increased risk for viral infections. And this is a whole laundry list of those, and I'm sure a few of them you must have heard during this uh, meeting. Uh, if you look at those, they all, all have a very high frequency of having warts, HPV infections. So uh, HPV infections should be given uh, in immunodeficiency susceptible to viral infection. When you look at the a live attenuated vaccine, they carry the risk of causing disease or infection, a disease. And therefore, they should be, or they are contraindicated in all severe primary immunodeficiency disease. So we listed those in the beginning. So all severe primary immunodeficiency patients should not receive a live vaccine. So here you see some of the examples, the rotaviral vaccine. This is the only vaccine which is given at a very early you know, uh, age, uh, and it is completely, uh, totally contraindicated in patients with primary immunodeficiency disease, as well as those receiving uh, a prolonged immunosuppression, although you don't expect them to receive immunosuppression at two months of age or so on. So it is primarily the severe combined immunodeficiency or a gamma globinemia. Varicella and zoster vaccines, again, they are contraindicated. They should be, again, not given those who are receiving immunoglobulin because it will interfere with the immune responses because normal immunoglobulin has antibodies because normal donors, they all got immunized. And so they have the antibody against uh, varicella and zoosters. Uh, so uh, again, very, very important because sometimes we get the question, uh, patient asking about the zoster vaccines. Uh, the MMR, again, like any other live vaccine, is contraindicated in those disorder. They are also contraindicated in phagocytic disorder, and we'll come back to that, and those receiving IVIG. All IVIG preparation has the antibodies to MMRs. So if you give any other vaccine against which there are antibodies present in IVIG, you can just imagine it is a key and a lock, so it will be always bind to it. So the, that vaccine is not available to stimulate whatever a small amount of the immune system can be stimulated. With so it is the uh, effect of the vaccines won't be there. Uh, then again, the oral polio. If you have intramuscular polio, that's fine. But oral polio, which is a live vaccine, is contraindicated. And it is contraindicated in a household context as well. Polio, uh, if somebody was reading 
a very recent uh, news, and this was in Wall Street Journal the uh, day before yesterday, uh, because the polio is still present in certain part of the world. And originally, uh, almost $7 billion was allocated to eradicate polio between 2013 and 2019, but it's still so very recently, uh, about last month, uh, the three Rotary International government, Canadian government and Gates Foundation pledged another close to $100 million to really er eradicate polio. Uh, polio, uh, beside the severe combined immunodeficiency, those are phagocytic cell defect uh, where it is contraindicated. Yellow fever vaccine, we just don't have the data on that uh, with respect to primary immunodeficiency. But taking uh, into consideration other uh, live vaccine, it is contraindicated in severe uh, immunodeficiency diseases, including the phagocytic cell disorder. The live typhoid vaccine is contraindicated in the same group. BCG, of course, we don't give here, but in the countries where tuberculosis is endemic, live attenuated bovine strain of mycobacterial tuberculosis is contraindicated. It can induce a disseminated tuberculosis in severe primary immunodeficiency disease, and there are a number of other primary immunodeficiency which you have not to uh, rem remember or think about it because they are so rare. Uh, in those cases, you can have a disseminated BCG. Where BCG is required and you are not sure of the immunodeficiency, then you might postpone it, although with the now current newborn screening, we will be able to prevent that and be able to give or not to give uh, the BCG vaccine in those cases. So, <coughs> uh, in severe combined immunodeficiencies, inactivated vaccines have no benefit effect because there are no adequate immune response. And more often, they will be on immunoglobulin treatment as well. Uh, live vaccines are contraindicated. These are just journal for group of diseases. Mild combined immunodeficiency, this is as opposed to a complete DGR syndrome, this is partial DGR syndrome, who are not in immunoglobulin therapy, inactivated vaccine may be given or recommended, while MMR and varicella may also be given. So these are mild type of uh, immune deficiency. Again, a inactivated vaccines will have not much of the effect uh, because the same reason as a skit that they don't make antibody response. Exiting a gamma globulinemia has no B cells, so they can't make any antibodies, and they will be on immunoglobulin therapy. Uh, CVID patient, they could have some residual antibody responses, uh, but the, and those who are not on immunoglobulin therapy, they could be given those inactivated vaccines. And sometime, in some cases, inactivated vaccine given with respect to, as I said, for influenza, it is recommended because we don't have a strain specific antibodies in the preparation. And secondly, some of the T cell responses can be stimulated in those cases. IgA deficiency, these are the minor one. IgA deficiency, uh, here, the, although both live and inactivated vaccines can be given. They can produce some protective response. However, if you have oral polio are contraindicated in majority because patients who have no antibodies, X-linked gamma globinemia, there it has been seen that they can excrete polio for quite some time. In phagocytic cell defect, in the classical example being chronic granulomatous disease, and now you have uh, a, a part of the IDF in the chronic granulomatous disease where 
the cells can phagocytize bacteria, but they can't kill because they can't produce the bleach inside the cell. And these patients should receive inactivated influenza because the influenza, along with a staph infection to which they are very prone to, increases the mortality of these patients. So influenza vaccine should uh, be given in patients with uh, chronic granulomatous disease. Live bacterial vaccines are contraindicated, BCG as well as oral salmonella. Live vaccine, except the polio, can be given in CGD and uh, congenital neutropenia and cyclic neutropenia. And live vaccines, so those are the group of phagocytic cell, but there is a subset of phagocytic cell defect like Chardiac-Hagashi syndrome and leukocyte adhesion diseases because in them, beside the neutrophil, there are other leukocyte defect as well. So other innate immune system, again, this is a whole list. Uh, you can take a copy of it or it will be on the IDF website. Uh, so I'm not going to go but since these are uh, relative rare disorders. It's the same way. Okay, now the question comes, the vaccination patient with acute illness. So vaccines should be postponed in moderate to severe acute illness because you just don't know at that time if you have any reaction to the vaccine to evaluate whether, you know, because the patient have acute infection and should be given as soon as those acute uh, infection or illness are improved. Minor, minor illnesses have no contraindication for vaccination. Antibiotics have no contraindication to vaccination except if antimicrobial agent may interfere with the response to oral typhoid vaccine. So if one is giving the typhoid, that may be an issue, otherwise not. Antiviral agent against herpes virus may interfere with the response to varicella containing vaccine. And then antiviral agent, uh, influenza virus, those may interfere with the response to live, but we don't give the live uh, influenza vaccine so because it was tried uh, and at time is still given in HIV patient, which is given by aerosolized through nas no, and nasal mucosa. Patients receiving immunoglobulin therapy, as indicated, most of the vaccines are not required because the protective antibodies are present in the preparation. Inactivated influenza and HPV vaccines may be considered because not uh, with, because they can induce some cellular response. Uh, live vaccines should be avoided because they interfere with the immune responses. Uh, and let me see, vaccine should be given at site different than what is you use with subcutaneous immunoglobulin. So site should be different. Uh, patients who are receiving corticosteroids, especially one has to be inactivated vaccine you can give. When you had talk about the live vaccine, if they are, for example, in children, if they are on corticosteroid at more than two milligram per kilogram body weight, and given for more than two months, they are the one should, you should avoid giving the live vaccine uh, and wait uh, at least two months uh, before you give the vaccine. Uh, let me leave the traveler's one, a, one comment on the allergies to, and this is true whether you have primary immune deficiency or not because the vaccine component may cause local or systemic allergic reaction, including anaphylaxis or anaphylactic reaction. And those are mostly either you have the animal protein in allergens, and this is the chicken egg, which is used in flu vaccine and the yellow fever vaccines. So if somebody is, has the history of anaphylactic reaction to, <laughs> then you have a problem. Uh, rarely, gelatin may <coughs> cause anaphylaxis also. Uh, there is a alternate recombinant flu vaccine. 
Uh, antibiotic, as I told you, neomycin is the one that should uh, be of concern. Okay, and some people used to think about thimerosal. That's all gone. There's no vaccine. Those were taken out in 2001. Administration, uh, commonly the vaccine may be administered safely, effectively, simultaneously at a separate site without impairing the immune response. So that's important that you are not doing. There are a few where you can do it, but otherwise it is better uh, to give different sight and maybe also space them. And let me just ask you this quiz. A 15-year young boy with XLA was to travel with his parents to Congo. Yellow fever is epidemic in Congo. He's on immunoglobulin treatment. Uh, what would you do? <laughs> uh, he said, no, I have to go. Because we can only say what they should do, right? So in case that patient and the parents say, oh, he has to go, we, we have job assignment there, and he has to go, we can't leave him. So then, of course, you definitely explain them the risk of those. Give them all the tips for avoiding the vectors, how you, you can... He can be protected while he's there. Uh, and uh, hope for the best, you know, and, and definitely you have to give doctor, you have to give as a physician a note for the waiver of the yellow fever vaccine because that will be very important. So you will be, be just amazed sometime it happens. And that lastly, this is the patient we had uh, about a week back. A 56-year-old woman with CVID with a history of adverse reaction to IVIG and subcutaneous immunoglobulin uh, came to us in the clinic, and during that first visit, we were told two days later that she was exposed in that waiting room while she was waiting for an hour or two hours that she was exposed to chickenpox patient. This patient was not an immunoglobulin because of those. And... <laughs> We don't know the status of her T cell function, and we don't know the antibodies to zoster. So, should we give her a vaccine? Yes or no? no. Okay. So, and why don't don't we give them? Yeah. The second important thing is for for varicella or zoster. Once you are exposed, the post-exposure, you do not get prophylaxis with the vaccine. So it has to be done real before that. Once you are exposed, it's not. So what you are going to do then? Give her Valtrex. Huh? Give her Valtrex. <laughs> so you give a varicella zoster or zoster immunoglobulin because those are available. So, and that's what was done to this patient. Okay, let's stop here, and uh, that way we can uh, discuss uh, the questions. Dr. Gupta, you do have some questions here. I'm going to hand them to you if you could address them. And if you have questions, you can hand them to me. Okay. The first question is, do you recommend patients with common variable get single vaccine? A... As you know, they are going to make an impaired response. It's a live vaccine. It's an impaired response. In my case, what I do is, A, I check, and these patients will be on immunoglobulin, so very likely they will have plenty of zoster antibodies there. And therefore, if you give them, it's not absolute contraindication. You can give that vaccine, but the response to the vaccine will be very much impaired if they have pre-existing antibody, because that's what you want to induce. And if the preparation of the immunoglobulin has plenty of protective level of those zoster antibodies, why you want to give? The one argument we can make is, okay, it may not work in that, but it may stimulate some component of the T-cell system. So it's not a recommendation, 
uh, that we go right out that we don't give or we give that. It is just on case basis that you look at it. If patients are having recurrent episodes, there you may try to see if it will stimulate a T cell component which will reduce that frequency, but otherwise not. Because sometime, theoretically or scientifically, what it could happen is, because you have vaccine and you have antibodies against vaccine in the patient, so what will happen? They will complex, right? So what we call as immune complexes. If a patient is susceptible or at risk for getting an autoimmune disease, it may turn on the complement and may precipitate that. This is all scientifically, theoretically possible. And I remember one case with it happened with the hepatitis B a uh, long time back that after second injection, because there you, you give three shots. Nobody checks, you know, antibodies, how much antibody you made after the first booster. And that patient has plenty of antibodies. And then third was given. And after that, she developed lupus. And she has all the genetic makeup of the lupus. So those are rare cases. But theoretically, as you can think about it, there is a possibility. So the question one has to ask, is there a benefit of giving that? And we can just only, there are no data whatsoever, we can just think about if somebody is getting repeated episodes of zoster in shingle uh, infection, and you have immunoglobulin, enough antibody, what it is telling you, that is not sufficient to protect you. And therefore, there you can take an argument, let's give and see whether the T cell system will be stimulated and might help. Yeah. Uh, do patients with CVID have a higher risk of getting signaled? No. Uh, you did not mention the risk of heavy metals and other toxins that are common in vaccine. As I said, there are no, to my knowledge, there are no heavy metals and no toxins in the vaccines. So. Uh, I have no, uh, and somebody wrote as mercury, so I already uh, told you uh, as was mercury was a thimerosal, and that was taken out in 2001 because of that, all the big thing with respect to autism. Okay, what you recommend for a person with CVID on IVIG with non-detectable level of memory B cells, anti-cell defect, class B switch cells, what vaccine should be given. Again, as far as those switch cell and all that, they are more from an academic point of view because you can imagine if that switch cell was causing the entire problem of this, we would have found some way to manipulate the switch B cell. So switch B cell is one of the findings that you see and it is not unique to CBID. Uh, we have seen that in other primary immunodeficiency disease. So based on the laboratory test, it is not that you are uh, deciding with respect to the vaccine. Vaccine, as far as either they are severe immune deficiency or not, or mild immune deficiency. And that's what we have to see. If a patient with CVID, which may be a very small subset, have both a combined effect a very severe T cell defect as well as a B cell defect severe. There you may be cautious about live vaccines. And again, this patient will be on IVIG, so will have antibodies against most of the live and inactivated vaccines. So the only one which I told you is the flu vaccine. So once the patients are on IVIG, those things become really not that relevant. If a CVID patient has the pneumococcal vaccine at the beginning of her diagnosis 10 years ago, is there any need to get the second vaccine? Her number of serotype went up after first vaccine. Okay. Now, if this patient was diagnosed 10 years back, obviously this patient has 
is on IVIG, right? And IVIG has plenty of antibodies against pneumococcal vaccines. So again, while the patients are on IVIG, you don't need to give any other shot. Again, you can take a view if patient breakthrough infection or something, again, there could be a number of reasons that either in the preparation you don't have enough pneumococcal antibody titers or the doses are not sufficient for that particular patient, you change those. And lastly, if you want to do it, and if a physician wants to think about it, there's always an option that you can give a second dose, although all the experiences, the booster of Pneumovax doesn't increase the immune response. Is it safe for CVID patient on IVIG for a spouse to receive varicella zoster vaccine? No. If yes, so there's no question of yes. Uh, I have been on methotrexate for over a year now for my rheumatoid arthritis. Should I refrain from all immunization except flu vaccine? I do receive immunoglobulin replacement therapy also. So, Number one, once you are in immunoglobulin therapy, you have those antibodies, regardless what you are getting, okay? As far as methotrexate, it is a very mild immunosuppressor. You receive for rheumatoid arthritis in general, about 100 milligram once a week. So it is a very mild immunosuppressor anyhow. Uh, but once you are on IVIG, you are safe. Okay, if the spouse of the PID patient get the single vaccine, is there risk for the PID patient if that PID patient is not in immunoglobulin? So they definitely carry a little higher risk that way. Uh, but again, it is not, since they are getting immunoglobulin preparation, you are not required to give them a very cellular immunization. And as far as how long uh, somebody is infectious, in varicella or in zoster infection, two days prior to vesicle appearance. So in the prodrome phase, also they are contagious from that point of view. And it continues till the crust come out. If the patient gets it, the crusts are not the criteria in those cases. They may continue even longer than that. So if the spouses, again, they have been already exposed to it. Once you expose, you do not have, so you have to just watching them. You can give the antiviral to them. That's the only thing which is recommended that if a patient, uh, the spouse is there, this is for the spouse of the patient. So uh, he is the one who is exposed. So there's nothing very much will be done. You have to give the antiviral at that time because they have been exposed. The vaccine won't be helpful once you got exposed. Uh, and for the patient, if the patient is on IVIG, you are not to worry about. Okay. Okay. Are the attenuated vaccines, zoster, contraindicated in mild primary immunodeficiency? Not really. If your child was given vaccine before XLA diagnosis, including MMR and polio, what happens to vaccine in their system? Can live vaccine linger on? That's a, that's a good question, you know. Uh, we don't know. Uh, one of the things very important with the polio, polio, most of the viruses, our both antibody system and the T cell system are defense. With polio, it is predominantly an antibody system. And so the vaccine could, if it was a live vaccine, if it was an oral vaccine, it could have cause, but there's nothing you can do about it because these patients won't make antibodies. So you can't do the vaccine, anything about it. So you have to just hope for the best that they were given and nothing happened. But as for the virus, 
viruses, because the vaccines, when we look at them, because you see the vaccines, we have the response, some of the vaccines for lifetime. You get immunized when you are a little kid, and if 50 years later you do the antibodies, they still have the antibodies. And one of the reasons they have, because we always say our immune system, the T cell and B cell, they can have the memory for something we have been immunized or exposed to for 40, 50, 60 years. But they were all based, some of the mouse study back in late 60s and early 70s, where we could demonstrate by some antigen that we injected, it was albumin in those cases to the mice, that those bits of those antigens were stuck in the lymph node, in the dendritic cell, and they keep stimulating those lymphocytes to make the antibodies. So whether giving the polio, they get stuck there, linger there for a long time, I can't say that. Okay, due to newborn screening and more identification of baby with T cell lymphopenia and partial T joint, do, uh, do you give MMR visera without T cell count or lymphocyte function? I think that those are very, very important because you have to make sure uh, that they are T cell function because you have to make the diagnosis that the patient have a, even a significant severe immune deficiency may not be classical deficiency if they do have, you don't want to give any live vaccine. Because the risk outweighs the benefit. Okay, smallpox, this is the last one. Smallpox is contraindicated for immunodeficiency patient, but what about household member or other with regard to contact with immunodeficiency patient? Again, you don't need, there's no immunization, which is smallpox, it's said, chickenpox. I think in this one, I can't tell you for definite, uh, as far as the smallpox, you know, uh, whether a smallpox uh, immunization to be given. Oh, j just as a prophylaxis? No, you see, we don't give a smallpox. I thought they were exposed to, no. Absolutely not. We don't give a smallpox vaccination because we have a immunodeficiency. Uh, child or uh, uh, saber, whosoever uh, with us. Thank you so much. Okay, you. you're most welcome. <laughs> These are uh, the three references. Again, you will see on the website that you can uh, look at it because they will give you most of the information. Uh, anything else you want to do because the top one will give you everything, you know, what is recommended, not with regard to primarily the primary immune deficiency because there are no recommendations, but it will give you, you know, if you want somebody who wants to go some places where hepatitis or typhoid or something is there, they will give you some general because they are same for primary immune deficiency as general population is.